And on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport in North America, which I'll here and after refer to as SILTNA because that's quite a mouthful, uh, welcome to today's webinar. As you know, our speaker today is Mr. Jerry Bruno of uh, Vancouver Airport Authority, and I'll introduce him more fully in a moment. Uh, we're very glad that you've been able to join us, and we hope to see you at future SILTNA webinars as well. My name is Paul Miller, and I'll be the moderator for today's session. So just a couple of housekeeping items before we start. Uh, your mics are now all on mute, and please leave them on mute for the duration of the session. If you have questions or comments, and we certainly hope you do, please use the Zoom chat feature, and I'll do my best to collate them and uh, relate them to Jerry at the conclusion of his uh, formal remarks. Uh, unfortunately, those of you who are joining us via Facebook or LinkedIn apparently will not have access to that Zoom chat feature. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be made available to you after the conclusion. And of course, it will also be made available on Siltna's uh, website and social media platforms. Uh, as well, immediately after the webinar, we will send to all participants via email a survey, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would complete that survey. It really helps us to improve our product as we go forward. Uh, now, just a quick word from our sponsor. Uh, the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport is a 34,000 member professional institute that operates in over 100 countries worldwide. Uh, SILTNA, of course, is the North American branch. Uh, the institute exists to develop the art and science of logistics and transport. And we do that by a research, education, networking, and information sharing. If you or any of your colleagues are interested in joining SILTNA as a professional member, please uh, have a look at siltna.com. That's C-I-L-T-N-A dot com. Uh, so this webinar series and today's webinar, of course, are part of that educational mandate that I mentioned a moment ago. And today we are very fortunate to have Mr. Jerry Bruno as our speaker. Jerry is the Vice President of Federal Government Affairs at Vancouver Airport Authority. And in that role, he leads the advocacy program in terms of federal policy development, which he does in, in support of YVR's strategic objectives. Jerry's been in the airport business since 1974 and has been at the executive industry and board level since 1992. Uh, he has led numerous developments focused on the facilitation of international trade and travel. And I'll just mention a few of them here. Uh, Jerry's complete bio is available on the YVR website, but uh, some important ones include the Canada-US Open Skies Agreement, the facilitation of international trade, transport, and transportation. And again, I'll just mention a very few here. Uh, the Woodrow, Woodrow, I have a hard time with this, Woodrow Wilson Canada Institute, the Vancouver International Maritime Centre, and several working groups under the National Air Consultative Committee. But perhaps of greatest interest for us today, of course, is that Jerry is currently the Canadian co-chair and the CEO of the Future Borders Coalition, which uh, formerly was known as the Beyond Preclearance Coalition. And Jerry will describe this 60 member binational coalition in greater detail during his formal remarks. So clearly there was no one better qualified to address today's exceptionally timely topic, which is pathways to Canada US border recovery. So that's much more than enough for me and Jerry over to you and welcome again. Uh, well, thank you, Paul, for that uh, generous introduction and uh, thank you to Siltna for inviting me uh, to, to give this webinar on behalf of our Future Borders Coalition uh, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. I really appreciate your participation. I see there are a lot of our coalition members and government uh, partners who have participated in a number of our initiatives uh, uh, on, uh, on the call today. So thanks for joining and uh, 
uh, I will uh, be uh, available to answer some questions after this, uh, uh, this presentation. So thanks very much. I uh, just wanted to begin to provide some, some context. Uh, you know, every five to seven years, uh, Canada and the U.S. have come up with a, a new uh, border cooperation agenda. You can see some familiar faces up there, but you know, uh, back in 1995, uh, we had the Shared Border Accord uh, under uh, Prime Minister Gretchen and, and uh, President uh, Clinton. Uh, we, then we had the Smart Border Action Plan, uh, and then uh, more recently, the Beyond the Border uh, uh, Plan, which was in uh, 2011. Um, now, this, this uh, Beyond the Border Plan was scheduled to have a second phase. Uh, we affectionately called it Beyond the Border 2.0. But after elections on both sides of the, the border uh, that came to a grinding halt. So there was no new activity to, to look ahead and, and keep the Canada-US border agenda and vision uh, moving forward. So uh, a number of us started to talk about, uh, uh, you know, the possibility of forming a, a coalition to tackle the unfinished business uh, of, uh, of the Beyond the Border plan. And um, uh, that was really the genesis. Uh, and after talking to, to a number of people, we started to uh, uh, come together. And uh, as you can see uh, uh, on this slide, we, we, we had a number of uh, members from uh, airports, airlines, ports, uh, think tanks, chambers of commerce, tourism, and trade associations. Uh, I'm not going to list them all. Um, uh, this is just page one. Uh, here's the second page. And, uh, you know, over the course of time, uh, we set this up as a three-year coalition with the intention of writing a white paper that would outline a, a vision for the future. And uh, uh, in, in the course of that, we uh, uh, raised over $500,000, uh, which was used to uh, produce a white paper and host uh, uh, a number of summits and, and events. Uh, I'd like to point out we have two new members uh, that just joined in, in the past couple of weeks, Pure Later, and of course the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. So, so, so thanks to you, I think we're up to about 62 uh, members uh, binationally uh, at this stage. So the white paper uh, was published in October of 2008. This is some <clears throat> uh, major themes in there, uh, use of, uh, of various technologies, uh, privacy by design was, was built into all of our thinking, uh, risk management solutions. Uh, the, the P4 model, which is really public-private policy partnership. So uh, unlike the traditional triple P, which is focused on infrastructure uh, funding, uh, this is, is, includes infrastructure funding, but also includes uh, the idea of uh, uh, working together in developing policy rather than government uh, starting out and, and uh, uh, coming up with uh, their own policy or industry lobbying for policy changes. Uh, the, the idea was to create uh, partnership forums to, to get that achieved. And of course, process convergence, uh, which is uh, uh, like uh, process reengineering on steroids, because uh, it, it kind of uh, in, involves uh, looking at uh, uh, processes uh, at, at the border that are performed by different uh, parties, and, and how do we bring them together so that one step, three steps become one step. So, so there's a lot of that kind of thinking in the white paper. I'm just going to give you a few examples of, uh, of some of the things that, that uh, are in the white paper. There's a lot of graphics in there. There's a lot of description of uh, 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 flows and, and, and concepts. Uh, this one here is just a, a representation of what a, a full intermodal integrated uh, uh, travel journey would be like using uh, uh, biometric for, for your identity uh, we're, we're using uh, facial um, a, a, as an example so uh, the idea would be that your face would be your 
passport and your travel visa if required and whether you're traveling on a plane, train, uh, cruise ship, uh, or, or crossing the land border by car. Uh, your, your facial verification would take place um, while you are moving, not, not uh, uh, stop. So, so that's, that's, that's part of the vision. Uh, a lot of information is already available to the border agencies. Uh, uh, before you travel and uh, so really a lot of the function that's done when you get to the border is a identifying your identity uh, and low risk uh, travelers can can move uh, quickly across both, both borders. Uh, this is a, an example of some uh, near term, um, you know, the, the, the pair concept pre arrival readiness evaluation with USCDP. Uh, has started at the, the Peace Bridge, uh, looking at this and, and taking it to, uh, uh, to the next step. Um, you know, the, the idea being that, that uh, for uh, uh, goods movement, truck transport across the border, um, you know, your e-manifests are 100% are uh, complete. Uh, yeah, you've got license plate readers, uh, facial identification, uh, for your drivers and in inspection equipment is located um, off to the side, but before crossing the border. So uh, basically you're 99% cleared and uh, you get on a dedicated lane and, and, and you have a rolling border concept where you're not stopping, you're, go, you're, you're moving. If you are uh, flagged for secondary, that happens after you cross the border, so you don't stop traffic and you get away from uh, from from congestion. Uh, the longer term uh, vision uh, is uh, something here. Got it. Sorry about that. Uh, the longer term vision looks at, at things like automated trucks and uh, truck platooning um, and, and using concepts like uh, uh, very advanced technology where uh, the, the, the trailer or container is already equipped. Um, did I do that? Are you guys seeing? Uh, I don't know how I did that, but uh, uh, I guess you're gonna have to put up with my, uh, uh, you can read it if you can't uh, hear me, how's that? Uh, but the idea would be you would use technology that, that uh, the inside of a truck trailer could be inspected uh, uh, remotely, uh, you know, whether it's cameras, infrared technology, et cetera. And then you could cross the border at speed. Uh, the border no longer becomes a border stop, but a, but, but a border flow. Uh, we're not talking today, we're talking, you know, 15 years from now. Uh, but as they say, you know, uh, science fiction today is tomorrow science. And, and, and that's a lot of what we're, uh, we're trying to, uh, uh, to get to. So uh, another thing we did as part of our uh, uh, white paper is try and get an estimate of what are we looking at in terms of, um, of, of savings. This uh, scrolling uh, thing is uh, a bit annoying. Uh, I don't know how to turn it off. Again, my apologies. Uh, basically what we're looking at at the uh, end of the day, if, if the 54 recommended changes uh, contained in the white paper uh, are, are applied and implemented, uh, we're, we're talking about a savings of $13 billion a year. Uh, and this is to both government and industry. Government in terms of staffing resources, uh, industry in terms of, uh, you know, time savings, less paperwork, and, and, and a lot of other hassles that, that we all have to go through when we're moving people and goods across the border. So the, the white paper was published in, uh, in October of uh, uh, 2018 now, it seems uh, like a lifetime ago. And we, we kind of presented it at our aviation border summit. It was uh, uh, put on by Vancouver Airport Authority in partnership with the Beyond Preclearance Coalition. Uh, we had a number of uh, 
uh, keynote speakers. We had representation from uh, U.S. government agencies, Canadian government agencies. Uh, we had uh, uh, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, uh, TSA, uh, CBSA, uh, uh, CATSA, Transport Canada, uh, a number of uh, uh, government departments, as well as uh, many of our uh, coalition members. Uh, we, we had breakout groups and uh, out of that came agreement on six working groups so that would be uh, composed of uh, government and industry uh, partners to uh, uh, look at implementing some of the recommendations contained in the, uh, in the white paper. Uh, following this, uh, the success of the uh, Aviation Border Summit, a lot of our other partners in rail and, and other ports, uh, other sectors said, you know, that was great for aviation, but what about the rest of us? And, and asked us to put on a broader uh, transportation border summit. Uh, so we kind of, uh, you know, on the heels of, of uh, completing that summit in October, a few months later, we put on a uh, transportation Border Summit in Washington, D.C. in April. Uh, we partnered with uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Chamber uh, gave us their Hall of Flags as, as a venue, which uh, uh, was their contribution, uh, and, and they also assisted in the, uh, in, in the program. Um, it was a great event. We had some uh, great keynote speakers uh, from industry and, and from government. We had, you know, John Osowski, president of CBSA, Deputy Minister Mike Keenan, Ambassador McNaughton. Uh, on, on the U.S. side, uh, Assistant Commissioner for, for U.S. Customs, uh, Assistant Secretary at uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so it was, it was really a uh, a very successful event and, and I think every one of those that uh, participated in it thought, thought it was great and out of that came some more working groups. Uh, so in, in total we ended up uh, with uh, with 10 uh, working groups and I'll, uh, I'm just going to briefly go through uh, some of these, uh, basically just list them. Uh, there are 10 of them. Uh, one was facial verification and identity management. And it was to, to look at the concept of how can we use uh, someone's face as their, uh, as their passport uh, to, to get them through the border. A uh, number of other things, uh, applied border policy research, uh, remote screening of goods and, and facilities co-location co uh, and uh, uh, so on. Uh, some more uh, uh, working groups that were established. One was dedicated to uh, security rescreening elimination, uh, another on uh, trusted traveler program integration. Uh, you know, there's a plethora of these trusted traveler programs. You've got Nexus, you've got TSA PreCheck. Uh, uh, you know, we, we still have CanPass on, uh, on the Canadian side, Global Entry, et cetera. Uh, CATSA has its uh, a trusted traveler program. How do we, you know, make it simple for 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 the traveler and, you know, combine as many of these uh, as possible? So you have, you know, one card, and and make uh, make the process simpler and and a card that could be used for both both uh, border crossing as well as uh, security screening. Uh, so out, out of that uh, transportation border summit uh, also came a request from our members that said, you know, uh, the three-year initiative technically will come to an end at the end of 2020. And uh, we have a lot on the go. We, we need to uh, continue. Uh, we need to continue with this initiative. Uh, we talked to some of our government partners. Uh, we actually invited them to... Uh, an executive retreat that we had in December, DC. Uh, we had uh, Homeland Security, public safety there. And, you know, th these are some of the comments and feedback they, 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 they get us about uh, the value of our coalition. Uh, they, they like that we looked at things binationally at short, medium, and long term, not just the near term. And uh, <clears throat> one of them said, we vote with our feet. And, you know, they, they, 
In other words, their participation in all our working groups and summits was uh, an indication of how uh, important they thought this was. <clears throat> and, and they thought we were uh, uh, providing help and forging consensus with, with uh, multiple industry groups. So as a result, we, um, we, we did go ahead uh, uh, with uh, uh, our plan to go forward. We decided we were going to incorporate, uh, implement a new membership due structure, uh, do some rebranding, which we have, and you'll see our logo at the bottom right. Uh, and we renamed the uh, uh, Beyond Preclearance to Future Borders Coalition. Uh, uh, we agreed we would appoint an executive director with uh, program management support. And uh, uh, I uh, volunteered uh, to, to be the executive director and, and CEO for 75 cents US a year. Uh, uh, for uh, at least a year or so, uh, we uh, hired some program management support. We hired InterVistas Consulting uh, to, to provide us support because basically uh, uh, I was handling this off the side of my desk with some of my colleagues at YVR. Uh, uh, although the working groups had secretariats uh, uh, from our members that supported them. Uh, advancing our coalition members, advance the work of the 10 working groups, uh, working closely with, with uh, our government partners, and there was a newly established executive coordination committee uh, co-chaired between public safety and homeland security uh, that we could bring uh, some of our recommendations to. Our plan was that by early 2021, we would have a second transportation border summit um, and then have some advanced uh, workshops, uh, one focused on travel and one on commercial uh, in the fall of, uh, of this year. Um, we're still looking at the advanced workshops. We, we could probably do that through uh, uh, Zoom or some other uh, uh, means. It's going to be tougher to hold a, a bigger summit. We're hopeful that uh, will be at a good stage uh, with respect to the pandemic where we will be able to, 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 to host uh, a bigger transportation border summit, but uh, date to be determined and, uh, uh, but that's still in our plan. Uh, board of directors, uh, basically we took the former executive committee and, and appointed them uh, to the board. Uh, Matt Morrison, CEO of uh, Pacific Northwest Economic Region, and myself are, are the co-chairs. Uh, we have Matt Cornelius from Airports Council International, uh, uh, Jennifer Fox from uh, NASCO, uh, Jess Ketchum, Rocky Mountaineer, Scotty Greenwood, uh, who, who's uh, very well known, uh, president of the Canadian American Business Council. Uh, Donnie Brown from Cruise Ship International, Mike McNanny, uh, National Airline Council, uh, Laurie McKee from, from uh, Toronto Airport. Uh, we, we have also uh, appointed a treasurer and a secretary, uh, Brandon Hardenbrook from uh, Penoir and Daniel Gooch from the uh, Canadian Airports Council. Now, uh, what's happened uh, since we developed our plan is the world has changed, obviously. And uh, we uh, have now uh, refocused our efforts on uh, border recovery. So we've decided to, uh, we have established a border recovery working group, uh, which uh, initially is the, the full board of directors, uh, Matt Morrison and myself as co-chairs. Uh, we, we're, we're happy to add others, but uh, because it's so complex and, and there are so many elements involved, we decided that we would have three task forces under this working group uh, to help um, deal with, with uh, specific elements. So uh, we've established an air border recovery task force. Uh, I'm co-chairing that with uh, Matt Cornelius from, from Airports Council International. Uh, we have a land border travel recovery task force, uh, which is co-chaired by Jennifer Fox uh, from NASCO and Lori Troutman from uh, uh, the Border Institute of Western Washington University. Uh, a supply chain goods movement task force and Allison Gifford from uh, UPS has agreed to be uh, the Canadian co-chair. 
Uh, Jim Titsworth from uh, BNSF Rail is uh, just waiting for, uh, uh, we're just waiting for confirmation, but uh, he's interested and hopefully he'll be able to take on that, uh, that role. So uh, we see these working groups um, uh, taking the lead on uh, border recovery solutions. Um, it doesn't mean the, the, the other work we had started will uh, disappear. Some of it will be put on hold, uh, but the other elements um, like, like the facial verification and ID management uh, working group will probably be rolled into uh, some of these uh, task forces because what, what they're doing, the work they were doing, will be integral uh, to uh, what we want to accomplish uh, in the uh, border recovery initiative. This is just an example of a concept, uh, health preclearance pilot uh, project. Uh, we've been talking it up. We developed this idea at, at Vancouver, uh, even for uh, domestic travel. Uh, it's not ready for prime time. Uh, there's a lot that has to be done uh, for this to come into play. But we have been talking with uh, public health authorities and uh, Transport Canada, uh, <clears throat> CBSA, and, and others on this concept. Uh, in, it's basically dependent on um, a rapid uh, and accurate COVID uh, testing uh, being available. The public health agencies have told us that within the next four to six months, they expect that to be uh, you know, uh, available. Uh, you know, automated temperature checking, uh, we're already uh, doing that uh, at airports and we can tie some of this into uh, contact tracing, uh, immunity testing, immunity passports, etc. So the idea would be that if you can have a rapid test in uh, 30 minutes to, to 45 minutes uh, with, with a result, uh, our terminal, airport terminals are empty. Uh, and uh, we, we could uh, find an area, whether it's in a parkade or, or inside the terminal itself, where a uh, public health agency could perform some of these tests. And uh, if, if you're cleared, uh, you can go into uh, the terminal building uh, without having to worry about masks, social distancing, et cetera. Um, and the same with the aircraft. So everyone in the terminal would then be uh, considered from a COVID perspective as, as COVID free and uh, uh, travel would be like it used to be. Uh, and, and the most important thing at the end of this is no need for a 14 day quarantine on arrival. This is the biggest issue uh, for travel and the tourism industry because uh, no one's going to take a two-week vacation if they have to quarantine for 14 days. No one's going to go for a one-day business trip if, if they have to quarantine for 14 days. Uh, we're, we're in discussions with uh, a, a number of groups. Uh, it looks like the uh, Department of Commerce in the U.S., for example, have told us they're very interested and have asked for a proposal. They're interested in funding this because they see this as a a, a solution, you know, they're putting billions of dollars in, in uh, uh, propping up the economy and uh, something like this uh, would be far less costly uh, uh, because industry could get back on its feet on its own and uh, the economy would be on the uh, road to recovery. And the beauty of it is if it does work, we are trying to, look to work towards a pilot. If it works, it could be applied uh, at the land border, could be applied at a cruise terminal, could be applied at a railroad passenger terminal. Uh, this is just a, a sample of the idea of a land border crossing uh, uh, booking app, uh, you know, that, that you could use to, 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 to book a time. Uh, so it would reduce uh, queues. It could have your health information as well as your nexus status. Uh, and, and if you are in a uh, sort of, uh, you've been COVID tested already, uh, you could be cleared to cross the border uh, much, much quicker. Uh, further information, uh, you can contact me. I have two emails now. In addition to my YVR email, I have a, a Jerry Bruna Future Reporter Coalition. Matt Morrison, our co-chair, Solomon Wong at Intervistas. And unfortunately, I think this, um, 
aut automatic translation uh, uh, closed captioning is blocking uh, uh, our uh, future borders uh, contact info. Uh, but we have a website, uh, uh, www.futureborderscoalition.org. You can download a copy of the white paper. You can contact us. Uh, if you're interested in participating, our coalition members are obviously welcome to participate in our uh, working group and, and task forces. Uh, so that's it. I uh, uh, just wanted to give you an overview. Obviously, there's a lot more in this uh, than I've been able to, to present in the short time, but um, I, I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, Jerry, that's just tremendous. and. Uh as I'm sure many of us on here uh, travel across the U.S.-Canada border often, or we hope to do so again in the future, we uh, really thank you and the coalition members for the, for the work that you're doing. Uh, some questions are starting to come in. Uh, I'll use my prerogative as, uh, as moderator to ask one or two while we, while we queue them up. Jerry, uh, a lot of this work obviously is, is process type work and very involved process type work. Uh, probably, no doubt further complicated by the fact that you're dealing with uh, uh, both the Canadian and US governments. So, you know, that work on, is ongoing. But in terms of the technology that, that you see, you know, uh, available now and, and for your future vision, how much of that technology is there now and how much of it uh, do you think you know still has to come in order to to meet some of those future uh, future uh, visions that you've laid out uh, a lot of the technology uh, is there uh, certainly for the uh, shorter and midterm uh, solutions uh, the long term obviously uh, uh, technology is uh, uh, already under development, uh, but, but the majority of the technology is uh, actually exists. It, it is being used in, um, uh, in, in other modes and for other purposes. So it's a question of uh, you know, applying them to, to the transportation and the border. Well, that's, that's tremendous. Uh, we've got a question here from uh, Jay Sulm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly who refers to uh, hysteria and hype in the media, how, and he asks how can we, or how do we go about moving the agenda towards a more positive potential in terms of travel and trade across the border? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're on the Canadian side, we're working uh, very, very uh, closely with uh, uh, Transport Canada and uh, others. Uh, to communicate this with public health agencies. We, we, we've got to get to a point where, um, you know, there'll be some stuff coming out soon uh, that, 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 that you'll be seeing. Uh, airports are all moving uh, to, you know, uh, uh, communicating uh, all the measures they are taking for healthy travel. Uh, Air Canada has, has uh, implemented their own uh, uh, safe flight uh, not sure if I got the name right, Sarge, uh, but but they have a, a, a program where where, where they're, they're doing temperature checks, masks, uh, keeping the middle seat empty. Um, uh, airports are doing the same thing, uh, deep cleaning. Uh, we're, we're looking at touchless technology so that you know you're 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 not handling things. So there's a lot of stuff going on, and we are uh, as an industry. Uh, airlines, airports, and government, and we're, we're going to be rolling out uh, uh, communications uh, around that. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing the same with our, uh, we have a communications working group under Future Borders that, that will uh, take some, some of that on. Okay, that's tremendous. Uh, got a question from Serge Corbet, uh, who says, first of all, great presentation, Jerry and asks, uh, what's the major lesson learned with recent border restrictions and how do we avoid in the future such a disruption to trade and travel? Uh, thanks for that, Serge. I, I, one of the things we're, we're uh, 
discussing is some of the uh, uh, mechanisms we want to put in place, particularly if we get to that uh, health preclearance uh, concept and, and can implement that uh, and, and tied with immunity passports. Um, uh, one thing is scalability so that, you know, uh, as we, as travel returns, we're going to have more and more people having immunity uh, passports, which is good. The other is uh, as this uh, pandemic uh, hopefully uh, disappears, uh, maybe we'll have a smaller second wave, uh, but we'll have a system in place to deal with the next pandemic. Uh, and, and, you know, unfortunately, uh, air travel has been seen as a, the super spreader, if you will, uh, globally, and we're trying to turn this around so that uh, air travel uh, actually becomes the containment mechanism and, and uh, by having these screening measures in place uh, uh, and, and able to scale up as something happens and we'll we'll be able to step in and start containing them so we're not faced with um, uh, all of these uh, border closures and quarantine requirements. Uh, we we want to be part of the solution. We don't want to be the problem. Right, right. Got quite, a, quite an involved question here from uh, Alice Zhang, uh, who notes that, uh, uh, you know, to implement a lot of this, we'll need uh, considerable infrastructure at airports and other places, especially to meet the health fo focus requirements. And of course, this costs money. And she goes on to ask, will there be a gap upon removing travel restrictions between governments issuing new protocols and industry, for example, airports, having the ability to meet those protocols to implement the solutions for operation? I'll, I'll stop there. She's got several more questions as well. Okay. I mean, I mean on that, uh, we're already doing some of this stuff. I mean, we, we uh, uh, speaking for Vancouver Airport, we have an innovative travel solutions uh, team that developed the automated border kiosks. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had put in place at airports across Canada and the U.S. and, and internationally. Uh, we are uh, uh, upgrading those to include contactless uh, technology, et cetera. So some of this stuff uh, uh, can, can already be, be done and, and be available. Uh, some of it, yes, will, 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 will involve additional uh, infrastructure. But, but as I mentioned, governments are looking at, you know, there's a cost benefit to this. Uh, you know, do you spend billions and billions of dollars in bailing out uh, industry sectors, uh, or do you maybe make a one-time investment of a few hundred million and and equip uh, our airports uh, and and other uh, uh, travel uh, transportation providers uh, to have this technology in place and, and let them thrive uh, on their own. And, and bring uh, economic recovery to all of us. So it's, it's a cheaper alternative, let's put it that way. Okay, and, and ju I'll just summarize uh, the remainder of Alice's questions by asking uh, what role, what, what's the principal role that government would play in sort of closing that gap in the meantime? Uh, well, the, the uh, uh, they're already playing that role. I, I mean, we, we are involved on the uh, on the Canadian side. We have the National Air Consultative Committee, uh, which in, includes uh, airports, airlines, CBSA, transport, and other departments. We have an air. Uh, uh, we, we have a, a restart and recovery working group, uh, and uh, we're looking at setting up uh, task forces uh, to deal with a lot of these these issues on the domestic market. And uh, you know, we're we're I've had preliminary discussions uh, with U.S. government agencies that are part of our other working groups who who have uh, committed to uh, be on our, um, on our border recovery, uh, working group as well. So I, I, I think partnership is key, uh, and, and, uh, keeping the dialogue open. And I think if you bring all the right people together, you're going to come up with uh, much better solutions and an, uh, an ability to work, work quickly. I mean, governments want to get out of this mess. Uh, they, 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 they can't afford to, 
subsidize uh, every living being on this planet for five years. I mean, we, we, we gotta be uh, doing things now. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Colin Lachlan uh, poses a very interesting question here. Uh, notes that IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon have recently called for bans on facial recognition technologies by police, citing racial violence, I'm sorry, racial bias, and high degree of false positive and false negative. Uh, is this call a concern to uh, your projects? Uh, no, I, and, and I'll tell you the reason why. There, there, there are two things. There, there is this uh, facial recognition technology, which is you know the police state, where you have cameras everywhere trying to uh, identify people. What we are talking about is uh, facial verification, and, and that's quite different. And the, the big difference uh, uh, with that is um, your, your, uh, your passport, uh, as an example, contains your electronic, your digital photo, right? Uh, and and uh, you can use that and transmit it. You, you have readers that will read uh, uh, your digital photo and uh, uh, match it to a picture that they take of you as you're crossing the border, as an example. So if you do that, you're, you're, you're not, this isn't a surveillance tool. It's just matching uh, your, your picture. And, and if you think about it, what, what happens to today in most cases is uh, you come to a border officer, they, they look at your passport picture and they look at your face and try and make a determination if you are who you say you are. Uh, uh, what facial verification does, it takes that away. It, it, it uh, um, automates uh, the process of facial matching. Um, so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a different, diff different concept. Uh, the U.S. has been using it uh, uh, at the border, uh, at airports, and others have been using this kind of technology. It's already available. Uh, we're looking at one that, that makes sure we have privacy by design uh, built into it. Great, great. Um, we're, uh, from Justin, uh, the, in 2019, the Unified Regulatory Agenda, uh, C US CBP included a proposed rule that would, quote, harmonize nexus and sentry fees with those of global entry. Uh, and goes on to ask, do you have any intelligence on the status of that proposal? Uh, and notes that for Canadian nexus holders, that would mean about a 250% membership fee hike. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 hopefully it's not going in, in, in that direction. I think, uh, Nexus is, is, is different than, uh, Sentry. Um, and, and I know the cost structure is, is different. And what we've been proposing through our trusted traveler program, uh, integration working group, Mexico is not included in that, by the way, it's just Canada, U.S. Um, and, and we are talking about, uh, uh, integrating some of those programs so that you don't have to pay for uh, uh, pre-check. You don't have to pay for uh, different programs. You only have one uh, and uh, one fee. We, we, we will certainly push for keeping that fee as low as possible going forward. Great. Um, Bonnie G asks a really interesting question and this is one of these pandemic um, uh, disruptions that I don't think anyone had ever thought of before, uh, but she, she asked, repatriation of ships crews continues to be frustrated by travel restrictions. Are there any immediate measures that can be implemented to facilitate the opening of controlled flights to certain regions? And a, a follow-up question, can the shipping industry and marine crews help pilot any of this technology? Um, I think so. Uh, absolutely. I, I mean, the, the, these are the types of solutions we're, we're looking at and what we're talking about uh, could be applied to different sectors, uh, different travel sectors. Uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, we have, uh, you know, uh, 
cruise line industry involved in, in what we're doing. We have ports involved in what we're doing. Um, and, you know, we welcome additional members. So uh, if you're not a member and you have specific issues and problems in your industry or sector, uh, feel free to uh, contact us and uh, uh, we'll make sure that we include, um, you know, solutions to help you out. Uh, in, in the work that we're doing under our coalition. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Roland Visser asks, uh, notes as many others have, great presentation, Jerry. Uh, the question, what do you see as the greatest hurdles to overcome for the advancement of, of the future borders coalition other than COVID-19? Uh, you know, like anything new, uh, it's it's uh, getting people to uh, buy into uh, some of these ideas and concepts. Uh, um, I, politics plays into it. Uh, you know, uh, policies. If you you, you start getting uh, uh, you know isolationist kind of policies and and uh, tougher border. Uh, uh, measures uh, depending on who's uh, who's in power at the time uh, could, could be uh, obstacles uh, but but I think over time I mean the the approach we've always taken is uh, we're not compromising security we're enhancing security uh, so you know we're, we're, we're hoping that that the arguments and and I'm a big believer I don't believe that facilitation and security are are, are opposite they're not different. I think they're two sides of the same coin. And, and all of the uh, new processes uh, that we've been uh, trying to develop accomplish both. They, they make security stronger, but they make facilitation uh, more efficient and faster. Uh, and you got to do both in my mind. Otherwise, uh, you know, nobody wins. Jerry, a lot of the, uh, not a lot, I think, perhaps almost all of the, the uh, process work that's going on here, of course, has been with the US government, or at least that's how I interpreted it. Uh, how much of this work would be transferable or scalable to other countries as these processes get vetted down between Canada and the US? Uh, well, quite, quite a bit. I, I mean, it's not just the US, it's, it's both Canadian and U.S. government that are the, that are involved. Uh, I I think we can uh, um, lead the way uh, if we do it right. Uh, what we develop could become a, a global standard. Uh, and you know the the other thing is it doesn't have to be the same as long as it's equivalent and and meets certain criteria. So health preclearance out of uh, Hong Kong or London might look a little different than what we're doing, but as long as it meets uh, the safety concerns of our you know, public health officers, uh, th then that, that's fine. We do that on the security side where you know, there, there are security standards uh, globally, but uh, certain countries do it in a different way, uh, but they may be, may be granted equivalency uh, from our security agencies here and, and, and in the U.S. So uh, there are mechanisms to, to, to accomplish that. Tremendous. Uh, Silton's own John Coleman asks, uh, is anyone working on the system architecture of the technology platforms which would permit easy change out of detectors to catch future types of risk that elude current detectors? Sort of a plug and play type question. <laughs> I, I'm sure there are. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of technology uh, companies out there that are, that are right now look, looking at uh, uh, all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, we're talking to some of them and, uh, uh, you know, as airports, I mean, airlines are talking to them, government agencies are talking to them. So uh, it, it, we, we, we don't adhere to any one solution. It's a sort of, uh, in terms of technology or, or provider of technology, uh, uh, we're looking at, at solutions. Some of it is already available, as I said. Other ha uh, is under development. And as it's developed, 
will we'll, uh, hopefully be able to incorporate it into uh, uh, what we want to do going forward. Great. Uh, Serge Corbet, you've made a, an, an observation here, which I'm afraid I don't quite understand. So if you would care to uh, enlarge a little bit upon that in the, in the chat, the, your comment about Clean Care Plus, uh, I'll, I'll make sure we get that question in. And then just a, a comment from Justin back to the, the fee structure. Uh, he notes, and I just read something, I believe uh, yesterday, how the, uh, the revenues of, of the border agencies on both sides of the border are, of course, taking quite a shellacking uh, in, due to the fact that a lot of, them, a lot of their, their revenue structure are fee-based and with very little travel, uh, there's very little fees associated. So he's a bit concerned still that, uh, that, that uh, there will be upward pressure on things like Nexus and Sentry and so on. And I'm not sure if you have any additional comment on that. Uh, well, first of all, the, the Clean Care Plus, that was the name of the Air Canada program that I was trying to remember. I, I think that's what Serge uh, uh, was trying to uh, bring up. It's a, it, it, it's a great program and, uh, you know, but uh, one, one of the big issues facing air carriers is, uh, you know, having to uh, have the middle seat empty, uh, which really destroys airline economics. And uh, that's why, you know, the, 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 the health preclearance concept eliminates the need for that. You know, they can fill the planes, but for now, uh, this is what we have to do until we get to the, the, the next phase where, where we're able to ensure that everyone getting on a, on a plane uh, is, uh, you know, uh, safe from a health perspective. Uh, on, on the funding issue, yes, CBP, uh, I mean, I had a chat with John Wagner a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner at CBP, uh, and he was telling us that, that um, uh, you know, the, they're losing funding and they have this COBRA funding, they have these user fees. Well, there's no users. Uh, they're, they're not collecting fees, so their budget is taking a, a big hit. Uh, and that's the case for, uh, you know, the rest of our industry, you know, there's no revenue. Uh, so any, anything that's dependent on, on passenger travel and passenger fees is obviously ha having a problem. Uh, the issue will be is, is uh, you know, U.S. government willing to plug that hole uh, by providing uh, additional funding. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that, you know, the, they're going to get something. Great. Uh, Marion Robson asks, how will the three task forces that you, that you highlighted be organized and uh, who will select the members uh, that will serve on those task forces? Well, the, the way we, we work at, uh, uh, like our other working groups, uh, uh, generally we, we uh, ask, uh, uh, for co-chairs, by national co-chair, so we, we've already done done that. Uh, we normally have one of our um, coalition members uh, serve as a secretariat uh, for the working group or task force, where you know they, they organize meetings, they uh, help uh, put together the work plan, um, and, and you know provide minutes and and, and all of that. Uh, and then uh, we ask uh, uh, our membership uh, who uh, wants to be involved if they have a particular interest. Some of our working groups end up being quite large and then we, we kind of chunk them down and divide up the work. And then we, we reach out to our government partners on uh, you know, the Canadian US side, uh, primarily you know, CBSA, CBP, uh, transport and, and, and others uh, where it's appropriate to nominate someone uh, to be on, on, uh, on the task force. So, so that's the process. We don't pick. We, we ask for um, those that have the greatest interest uh, in, in a particular uh, you know, working group or, or, or task force to reach out to us. And uh, you know, that, that's basically it. Then they're on. Great. 
folks, we, we probably got time for maybe one more question. I want to give Jerry a, a few seconds to see if he's got any further concluding remarks. So a last call for any questions via the chat. Um, hearing none, uh, Jerry, we've worked you pretty hard here. <laughs> and uh, we've noted your very gracious offer to uh, to uh, take additional questions and comments uh, via your uh, email and or telephone uh, off off of the this Zoom meeting in the days and weeks ahead. So we greatly appreciate that as well. Uh, but Jerry, on behalf of Siltna and its uh, and on behalf of today's participants, thank you very much for a very detailed. Uh, walk through the work of, of, of uh, travel and trade facilitation that the Future Borders Coalition is undertaking. Uh, any final comments from you, Jerry, before we wind up? Uh, well, thank you uh, for listening and, and participating today. I mean, it's an ongoing dialogue. Uh, and, uh, you know, just one more plug, uh, join our coalition, you know, the, the the bigger we are, the stronger our voice, um, and and the more we can accomplish. So, uh, look forward to hearing more from you. And uh, uh, thanks again. Okay. Well, thanks again, Jerry. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Jerry's contact information is in the presentation that you'll receive uh, when you receive the recording of this webinar. Uh, Jerry, the, the compliments just keep flowing in uh, on your presentation, so that's a very good sign. And this, folks, concludes today's webinar, uh, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thanks again to everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.